Hey, just a heads up that the following content may be disturbing or triggering for some listeners and is not appropriate for children. Please take care of yourself and others who may be listening with you. Welcome to the Bonus Babies Podcast, a show that has no easy answers, only hard questions. When I serve these children, I can see the face of God in them and their families. And I know that by helping them become their better selves, I've done my job. Can you tell me what you call the kids who you've cared for over the years? We feel that the children that we receive coming into our home are bonuses. So we call them bonus babies. I love that. This is your host, Jane Amelia Larson. And I'm a CASA volunteer, a court-appointed special advocate for youth in foster care. Yeah, I know it's a mouthful. In the same way a CASA works, I explore all things in the foster care maze by talking to kids, parents, caregivers, attorneys, social workers, therapists, anybody and everybody who will speak to me to keep the conversation open and the information flowing about all things CASA. My guest today is a truly inspiring individual. Juan Vélez is a supervising attorney with a children's law center in Los Angeles. And an attorney there might represent more than 200 kids in foster care. And in court, I learned so much from him because he's an educator as well as an advocate. He's a very special man because early on in his life, he made a choice to have fulfillment, joy, and depth in his life as he says. So he's taking care of kids in court instead of chasing dollars. Hi, I'm here with Juan Valles. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Hello. Thank you for having me. Oh, I'm so glad you're doing this. And I just want to remind you, I already told you this, but when I first saw you in court, I was just stunned. Number one, not only because you just look so fantastic, you're super dapper. I'm sorry that the listeners can't can't see what I saw. <laughs> well, thank you. It just it's super stylish and very composed and confident. And no one else in the courtroom looked like that, actually. People were wearing sloppy sweaters and flats and kind of like schlepping around. Wait, you know, I'm sorry, that's kind of mean. But anyway, you came in like a... Like you walked off the cover of GQ. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> I hadn't met you because even though I had been to court already three or four times, this was the first time that you were actually there for the case because you were the supervisor in the case, right? Correct. And immediately I saw I could ask you questions and you answered them. You didn't look so busy that you couldn't deal with things. Why is that? You can answer that. A little later on. Sure. First, I want to know, what's your background? You have described yourself as a nerd. So I want to know how many degrees do you actually have and what are they in? Sure. Um, I have a BA in linguistics, a master's in humanities, an MBA in management, and my JD. So four of them. <laughs> did you do them all at once? <laughs> or uh, did, you, did you do in succession or what? <laughs> yes and yes. I completed uh, the MBA and the MA in Humanities roughly concurrently. Uh, it was a lot of work. There were two halftime programs while I was working full-time. Uh, so it took some sacrifice, some dedication. Uh, but yes, they were uh, done concurrently. Otherwise, the... Um, the BA came well before those, and the JD came after those. Sure. Right. So the law degree was the last, right? And It was. How did you end up in law? I was rapidly approaching 30, and I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I had been in higher education for a while, doing student advising, uh, some student conduct work, but I wasn't sure I wanted to keep on doing that sort of work. Uh, so I figured, what's the most respectable job out there? I'll be an attorney. <laughs> and so I uh, applied to law school and uh, began in 2006. I had spent the uh, summer of 2007 uh, at a university in Seoul doing sort of a hybrid work abroad, study abroad program. And I returned for the fall of 2007, my 2L year. And immediately upon arriving in New York City after a summer away, I 
was part of the on-campus interview process. And that's where the largest firms come to campus and interview. It's sort of like speed dating. You get 30 minutes with a firm. That's right. Yeah. And everybody wants that like terrific internship. (laughs) Well, the paycheck is quite nice. I think that's why a lot of folks do it without really examining their motivations. So I went through the process, met lots of partners, visited a few firms, and it just didn't feel right to me. For better or for worse, I did not receive any offers, Hmm. uh, which ended up being a blessing in disguise. But nonetheless, I knew I had to do something for my 2L year. So I was sort of hemming and hawing, not quite despairing, but I was concerned. I was racking up all this debt and my heart was so unsatisfied. I happened to be walking down the hall at school one day and noticed a couple of flyers on a bulletin board. Uh, One was focused on loan repayment options for those who engage in nonprofit service. The first light bulb went off. Okay, this could be possible. I could possibly pursue a career in the public good and still pay off my loans, which were astronomical then, astronomical now. (laughs) Uh, But that was uh, some consolation that there was a way. On that same bulletin board, there was an advertisement for a fellowship in nonprofit work. There were, I think, five or six openings for students to apply for. And those selected will be placed in a nonprofit in New York City and receive a small stipend. As luck would have it, I was assigned to uh, Lawyers for Children. Uh, This organization handles most of the dependency foster care cases in Manhattan and a portion of Queens. And the moment I began uh, my internship or fellowship, I knew something was, something was up. It felt really, really right. Uh, so my work now is actually an extension of that. I began at the Children's Law Center in 2010, uh, October 2010, as a frontline staff attorney and spent several years in that role And as a staff attorney, you're really the frontline voice for children in court. A typical day is usually split between the office and the courtroom or some combination thereof. Very often, you might have five, six, seven matters on calendar in one day. So you're rapidly moving through your cases, presenting evidence to the court, making requests of the court, and most importantly, making your client's position requests and needs known to the court. Behind the scenes, there's a lot of... Just hang on one second, because I want people to get a sense of what what this is. So I'm a CASA, and I'm assigned to one case. You're an attorney in the children's court working for the CLC. Yes. And how many cases do you have? So numbers have dropped. Uh, We've decreased caseload numbers. The ideal is somewhere around 180 clients per attorney, and that can fluctuate up or down depending on a variety of factors. But right now, our attorneys are carrying about 200 or so children on their caseloads. Oh my, see, that's just astounding. I mean, it's just mind-blowing. Even no matter how good you are, how do you manage all that? A lot of the uh, the work really happens behind the scenes. A lot of it is gathering information from clients, so investigating a client's needs and interests and issues, uh, speaking with clients, speaking with caregivers, relatives, teachers, therapists, doctors, anyone who might have a better sense or a good sense of what our client needs. On top of the client, him or herself, uh, that's our primary source of information. So a lot of our time is spent really getting to know our clients and what they need. And then synthesizing all that information into something that can be presented to the court with the hope that the court will make an order that serves our client well. So do you feel, uh, even with that many cases, and you're doing research, talking to people in much the same way as ACASA does, I've, I've actually realized that you're talking to as many people as you can that know something about the case so that you can serve your client best. And when you say client, you mean kid. Correct. Right. Because all the kids are clients, right? Yes. Uh, uh, Rather, all the clients are kids. But um, 
You've described your work as a vocation. So what does that mean to you? Sure. I think that's actually a perfect segue. Um, I mean, you were touching on how is one able emotionally and intellectually to handle all of these cases? Uh, Because as you well know, these stories are complex. They're filled with trauma, with tragedy. So they're difficult on an emotional level. You also have the law that you're working with and trying to marry law and fact in such a way that your client's interests are furthered. There's no way to do this work unless you really love it, unless it really touches a deeper place in your psyche, your soul, your heart, what have you. So how is it a vocation for me? It really does allow me to serve in a way that I think is unique. My work has a clear, immediate impact on a child's life and the life of his or her family. And for me, that immediacy is extremely stirring and moving and encouraging. The days can be hard. The stories can be so difficult. But knowing that everything I do has a consequence just keeps me going back and keeps me motivated. And so it does allow myself and our attorneys to keep at it because we know that our work matters and we see real world results of what we do. You know, I think that um, when the average person thinks about a kid in foster care, they don't realize the army of caring adults that are looking out for them or trying to do right by them, trying to make their experience better, trying to secure them a better future, whether they succeed or not. There are a lot of very, very caring people involved. And yet, as you know, terrible things happen and there's a lot of disappointment. I know that with my own kid that she has somehow had this idea that her attorney and even me uh, would give her what she wants, whether or not it's right for her. And that's not exactly what you do. You're representing her or him uh, in their best interest. How have you run up against the difficulty of that? I think it's important that first and foremost, that the best interest analysis really factor in your client. Uh, Your client has to know that they're being heard, that their interests, their fondest, deepest desires and wishes and goals, all those things are taken into account. It's also important to be honest with our clients. You know, I am not the cure-all to what's going on in that child's life. But that being said, I can still help. I can still pull that child through a situation that is awful and difficult and challenging. So honesty is important. And honesty on an ongoing basis as well, as things are happening, good, bad, or otherwise, most children want to know and need to know. Of course, framed in in an age-appropriate way, in a therapeutically informed way, but children need to know that they have some agency in this process, that they're heard, that our voice is really theirs and echoing theirs. Um, But I think uh, to your earlier point about your own uh, clients, I think that in some ways for a lot of children, no one has done that for them. They haven't had an adult presence in their lives where they can't ask for something and receive it, uh, where those So I think a lot of children just really have not had the things that most children experience or have that make them full burgeoning people. And so we're often that first, that first resource that a lot of kids have uh, in their lives, especially when they're coming out of acute situations of trauma and abuse. There's some sense that we are perhaps a beacon in some ways and As a beacon, we can guide them and help them. I think as you all know, um, when a client asks for something, almost always we're driven to try to meet that request. Uh, We'll bend over backwards to make that happen. And again, it's largely because these clients may not have had those things and they should. And if we can help them find those things, let's do it. Why it's important uh, to have conversations like this you know, lawyers, 
as a larger professional group uh, have in some ways earned the reputation that they have uh, a certain level of avarice and graft and trickery and all those things. Uh, it's important for people to see that there are lawyers out there who are pursuing the public good, the greater good, and who sacrifice time and perhaps even income to make these things happen. Right. Because your background really could have earned you triple figures and more, right? And, you know, way more. I'm saying triple, but I'm really talking about 500,000 or, or more a year. When I graduated law school in 2009, uh, the starting salary for an associate uh, at a large firm was about $185,000 plus bonuses. <laughs> So uh, Plus bonuses, that's right. the, um, the art stick that we're measured against very often. I'm not going to ask you what you make now, but I know it's a fraction of, of what you could be making. So, And I'm very, I'm very happy. I'm very comfortable. I think that for me, uh, I'm, I'd rather make a choice that brings me fulfillment and joy and depth than chasing after a paycheck. That, that chase never ends. You can always earn more. And really... You know, it's a little corny, but I want to know, like at my last day, my last breath, that I've at least impacted one life in a positive way. And making half a million dollars in a big law firm just may not be the way for me. Some may, some may really love that work. It's just not for me. Has the work ever become too much for you or, or for your husband? I know you're married. You don't have any kids, right? We don't. Uh, it's just the two of us. Right. You have two dogs and a cat, so that counts a little bit, right? <laughs> Some fur babies, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but has the work ever been too much? I would be lying if I said that it's never been a lot or heavy. But I think for me at least, because I see it as more than just a job, I'm able to pull through. Now, apart from the work itself and that client contact and the impacts we have on our clients' lives, my workplace is extremely collegial. It's extremely supportive and does support the quality of our lives as employees. So for me, while the work may be hard, there's support in my organization that allows me to get through it. And for us quality of life and supporting our employees, knowing how hard the work is, that is extremely important for all of us. But my husband, so he and I met at court, actually, he's a court employee. So he's also immersed in uh, this work. <laughs> so um, if we're not careful, discussions about work can infect other parts of our lives. So you know, conversations over dinner, it's always there. So if we're not careful, it can really, really overshadow everything else. I think in part, it's because we value our job so deeply. But we're also getting better and better at really separating our husband and husband time from our work time. You meet so many needy children. Uh have you ever thought about fostering a child or adopting a child? And how, how do you hold that at bay? Or, You know, I, I've i often, unless so now, but I think when I was younger, I was open to the idea of being a father. But I've been very honest with myself. And I don't think being a father is for me. But that being said, I still have these instincts that are real and present. And for me, working with my staff of attorneys, with our clients, I can be nurturing, I can be supportive and teaching. And that, that really does, those needs get addressed through, through my work. My family is also a wonderful outlet for expressing some of those needs. My five-year-old nephew is uh, <laughs> my little guy. I'm sure this has happened to you because it's happened to every Casa that I know, including me, where a kid, maybe one that you have just met, begs you to take them home. And that's happened to you probably, right? It has, uh, especially with younger children. And it can be really, really heartbreaking. I think it's more difficult when you're a newer attorney 
uh, in part because you haven't developed a lot of those coping strategies that just come naturally as you progress in your career in this field. But those requests, those cries to be taken home, it reminds me of the importance of finding stability and permanency and a place for these children to feel safe and nurtured and loved. So yeah, it can be really hard to hear these things, but it's also extremely motivating. Can you talk to me a little bit about your faith and the monastic order to which you belong? I'm fascinated by this. Sure. So I am a member of a, an Episcopal community called the Community of the Gospel. I've been a full professed member for just about six years now, uh, involved for about nine years in total. We're a dispersed community, so there is no cloister or abbey or monastery where we all gather, uh, but we're spread across the nation. Darn, you don't have robes and, and all the, you don't have the incense and the chanting? Or- oh, Oh, we do. <laughs> so I feel like we were definitely a bit prescient here. I think that we, uh, so how we gather is largely electronically. So Zoom, conference calls, there's only one annual meeting where we all fly to Cincinnati and gather. But otherwise, we gather virtually and make community virtually. And this has been part of our identity for some years now. So this past year has actually felt a little bit less awkward having had the experience of intimacy through the internet previously (laughs) with my community. But as to robes, yes, we have all the vestments. And when I'm in that role, I wear a sort of an oatmeal colored gown called an alb and a uh, brown sort of cover called a scapular. And uh, what are the three tenets, three major tenets? Sure. Uh, The three, um, our charism is composed of three things, uh, study, service, and prayer. And no part of that is more or less important than the other. Um, They all work in tandem. And so each member is charged with discerning how they'll live those three pillars out. Um, There's no set rubric, but each person discovers through a pretty intense formation process how they'll get those things um, worked out in their daily lives. Is your husband involved in this with you? No. (laughs) I mean, he's definitely supportive, uh, but it's definitely a thing that uh, is really mine. And he shares in it when uh, there's perhaps a regional meeting and we've gone to Cincinnati together. uh, But it's definitely uh, my thing. Right. So this was this something you were drawn to as a result of the evolution of your faith? Or did you were you always intrigued by it or did you just come upon it? later? Yeah, it was actually a bit of a surprise. Uh, While I was living in New York and attending law school, I attended a um, a very large Episcopal church on the Upper East Side. And one of their programs, they worked with children of incarcerated parents. So New York is much wider east-west than it is tall north and south. New York City is on one extreme of the state, Most of the prisons are on the far western edges of New York State. And that drive is seven, eight hours. And so New York City itself is a large chunk of the state's population. The people who are imprisoned in the New York area are shipped all the way across the state, near Rochester, uh, near Buffalo. And most families simply can't afford the airfare, can't afford even the bus fare, yeah, they can't see them. Right. And um, as you know, if these children are involved in the foster care system, reunification requires frequent, high-quality visitation. And when you make it so impossible, you just thwart those possibilities. So anyway, I um, got involved with this group, and uh, there were about 20 children and about 10 chaperones. And we flew the children to Rochester got on a bus and went to a a women's prison for Mother's Day. And I think at that moment, I realized that my faith was best lived out through service. I could say all the right prayers. I could, you know, do all the rituals correctly and as they're sort of planned out. But my faith is nothing without actually doing 
and creating and helping. And so I think it was then when that seed was planted. Fast forward a couple years later, I just happened to be uh, Googling something about Episcopal theology or something. And I stumbled across this listing of communities and orders in the Anglican community, or communion rather, that's the kind of overarching uh, group that the Episcopal Church belongs to. I clicked on um, one of them, the Community of the Gospels, and something was really different about it. Just the, the vibe I got called me in. And so I emailed the, um, the guy in charge, our guardian, and he called me and we talked. He sent me a few books to read. I read those, talked again. But every conversation that we had, I was being drawn more and more into it until I realized that, yeah, this actually is a great way to kind of structure my faith. Issues of spirituality and faith are so nebulous and hard to really get your hands on and get your mind wrapped around those those concepts, but this gave me a real structure for taking all those thoughts and feelings and beliefs and making them tangible and applicable in a way that works for me. And do you feel that it helps you do your work at, at the children's court and your work with children? Oh, absolutely. Again, I think that anybody who does this work does it for a deeper, higher purpose, not necessarily one that's religious or theistic in any way. But I think that this work does require that you draw on something deep inside of you that provides meaning. And so for me, the service aspect of my community's charism is clearly lived out through my work with CLC. I find myself seeing Christ and others. That's a bit of a cliche, I'm sure. But when I serve these children, I can see the face of God in them and their families. And I know that by helping them become their better selves, I've done my job. My spirit has been touched and I come back for more. That's, it's, that's so nice to hear, you know, because they, uh, I sometimes, uh, you know, there was this one young woman I spoke with recently who thought that she had found her forever home after bouncing around in the foster care system for years and years. And the family was religious. And she was outed by the uh, biological older son. And that night, the family threw her out. And she was back, you know, in a a group home with her stuff in the bag. But I know that that's a little bit of the problem right now with a lot of the caregivers that are available to these kids in need is that many of them come from religious backgrounds that are conditional. And that makes it even more difficult for the children to find um, a welcoming and supportive home. Yeah, I think in our work, we, we talk a lot about physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, and so on. But I think we often forget about spiritual abuse. Uh, and that is such an, I think, an undiscovered aspect of abuse that we're just slowly starting to really delve into now, I think. But you're right, um, that abuse can be as traumatic as other forms of abuse and it can have lifelong consequences. Um, I mean, these things touch on sort of one's existence and questions of life and death and purpose. And when abuse touches on one's self-assessment in those areas, that's tough. Um, it can really become psychologically and psychically difficult and damaging and just really, really hurt. I think hurt is the, uh, the biggest word I can think of there. And I'm very fortunate. Um, my family, my faith are very accepting of LGBTQ people, uh, as part of the community of God and part of the fold. Uh, I'm very lucky and I'm very aware that that may not be the norm in religious contexts. And so for me, another way this feeds my work is if it comes up and it's not very often that it comes up, but if it does come up, 
I try to show that there are other alternatives. It's not this either or thing. I can be both gay and a Christian person. And those things can exist in a delicate dance, but they're not so black and white either or. And so for a lot of our clients, I know that that's an issue. Have you worked with a lot of CASAs? What's your experience been? Really positive. Um, I think you we discussed our large caseloads. And unfortunately, what that means is that we cannot be as present for a case as we would like to be. If uh, I had only 10 clients, those 10 clients would be so incredibly well served and paid attention to and so on. For me, CASA can be that right hand. They can be the ones who really do follow up out in the real world with services, with needs, with requests. And it also allows a client to have a consistent point of contact. Very often, we're in court all day and can't get back to clients or caregivers very quickly because of our court schedules. CASA always seems to be there and available to our clients. So I appreciate that there's a person that our client also knows is just my person. Clients don't always ask about how many clients we have in total. Uh, on occasion, they will, and I'm honest with them. Um, social workers also have large caseloads. But CASA, it's a one-to-one relationship that is so different. And for our clients, I think it does really help anchor them to the process, to have that one person that they know is just theirs. Um, and the relationships that develop between CASA and our clients are often much richer than what I can do. Uh, Not to at all discount the importance of my presence in a client's life, but CASA has the time to really develop a rapport with a client. And that rapport ends up being extremely helpful for the attorney because that CASA will have insight that no other adult on the case will have. And Good CASAs who know their clients, who spend the time to get to know their clients and really explore their needs, they make my job so much easier. Uh, So, and one thing I've also uh, come to appreciate is CASA has definitely made diversifying its staff a priority. And so CASA has been very responsive to the need for growing diversity in CASA volunteers, uh, whether it's age ethnicity, race, sex, sexual orientation, what have you, that, that our clients have people who look more like them and acknowledge some of those built-in biases and so on is helpful. You know, I think it's really important that you bring this up about, about the diversity because I, in my CASA training program in the, the class, it was very diverse. There was a lot of men. There were people of color. Everybody was all different ages, shapes, and sizes. But I know still that the actual pool of CASA volunteers is predominantly white old ladies like me, right? <laughs> and we really need a lot more other people. Um, even actually you um, in court, you're one of the few men that I saw that are a child's attorney. I'm sure there's others and I just didn't happen to see them, but it is seems to be predominantly women. And even, you know, I volunteer with a wonderful organization called Peace for Kids and they serve the uh, Watts Willowbrook community. And it's a, a program that's been around for about 20 years and most of the volunteers are women. And that's a common thread across the uh, helping professions, it seems. Uh, I'm not sure why exactly, but uh, definitely that's a reality. Yeah. Yeah. And that being said, for me, it's often important that the men who are available, who are present, that for a lot of our clients, we may be the only strong, positive male influence in that client's life. And so that's a responsibility that I never take lightly. And more than once, I've been asked by a client, can I call you dad? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, really? um, I I, I laugh, but it definitely reminds me that these children need 
a role model. I think we're programmed as humans to need other people. We definitely are. That's beyond question. And so I think that um, it's a good reminder that children will keep searching for role models until they find that person that fits, that does some good for them. Do you think that your work now is in part a result of how you were raised? I think two things come to mind. First is my parents were very, very civically involved when we were growing up. Um, you know, we spent, my sister and I spent so many weeknights at City Hall for council meetings, for block watchers meetings, all those things. So we had this clear sense from early on that it was important to be involved in the community and to give back. My parents volunteered for all sorts of things, my mother especially. And I recall, you know, being seven, eight years old, complaining about having to go to another police department board meeting or whatever it was. <laughs> um, and I never, <laughs> as a child, you don't really value those things. But as I get deeper and deeper into middle age, I realize all those things, all those experiences of service and spending and giving time for others almost predisposed me to do this kind of work. The other thing is that my family was uh, afflicted with some level of domestic violence and emotional abuse. Welcome to the club. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> and so for me, um, I think unconsciously it became a way to heal and through years of introspection and therapy, even I have really come to see the work that I do as a way to perhaps protect and heal that little Juan that was scared and hurt and abused as a child. I so appreciate you. Speaking about that, Juan, because I think there's, for many adults, especially ones that are uh, hoping to continue to evolve, sometimes you you put the things you don't want to think about, you just put it away, right? Because it's, it's, it's easier to put it away. But the reality is it's part of who we are. And it always surfaces somehow, <laughs> like it or not. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you mentioned something too uh, that I... I think is important to talk about that there's a tendency to vilify the parents wh whose children have been removed from them. Can you talk about your feelings about that and the way you think that the court tries to handle it? For people who are looking inward from the outside into the system, all we really hear about, or they hear about is the horror of child abuse. Now those stories are terrible. They're heart wrenching. They're difficult. But I think until you're really on the inside, it's hard to understand the cyclical nature of abuse and dysfunction. I, I tell my new attorneys uh, while training them that no healthy person commits acts of abuse. There's something in that parent that's damaged or broken that needs fixing that drives this behavior. So we can vilify their acts perhaps, Yes, these things are wrong, and no one ever questions the wrongness of abuse and neglect. But it's important to look a little deeper. You know, what's driving that? The whole system is premised on the notion that reunification with one's family of origin is the best solution. And without understanding the entire family's dynamic and their history, you can't make that happen in a smooth, really practical, long-lasting way. It's got to be this sort of 360 analysis of what's going on with the family. And I think you can also, you can hold parents accountable for their actions, but also be just and be merciful and striving toward some sense of reconciliation and wholeness in this process. Very often I'll tell my clients that the hard work isn't for you to do. It's for your mom or dad to do and we'll support them as they fix themselves so that your family can be whole again. And I think the court system, I think culturally, that's really a pretty consistent theme that we're not a court of punitive measures, you know, that we don't use words like guilty or not guilty, acquitted in our court system. Our case names don't have verses in them. Yeah, I noticed that. And that's a civil sort of thing, civil law. Uh, but 
I think it's also powerful in that we don't use those words. We don't see it in terms of win or lose. It's about fixing. It's about solutions and acknowledging brokenness. What would you say to people who are thinking about doing the work that you do? I would say that it's important to try it, but listen to your heart. This work is not for everyone. And to force yourself to do this work, despite it being a bad fit, benefits no one, especially yourself. I'd also say that as you move through the years of being in this work, your perspective on families, on society, on the many isms that impact our families, um, you just you grow so much through being so directly involved with these families. So that is probably one of the most rewarding things is that I have grown immensely through this, but it required that I listen to myself throughout this entire trajectory. So this is the, my last question. What is the one thing that people would not know about you if you did not tell them? Hmm. And you can't say that you're a monk. <laughs> you have to choose something else. <laughs> that one's out of the bag. <laughs> Um, <laughs> hmm. well, kind of a funny thing, completely irrelevant. I cannot stick out my tongue <laughs> physically. Wow. <laughs> yeah. There's some, there's something called the frenulum that's attached, uh, in the wrong way. So there you go. There's one thing that most folks don't realize. That's fascinating. <laughs> I, I, I kind of want to see it, but I'm not, but I won't ask you. Okay. When the courts reopen, we'll, uh, we'll readdress that. Um, <laughs> I, I just want to say I really appreciate the work that you do. I, I've i learned a lot just by knowing you, just being in court with you, I think maybe twice even, not even. Um, uh, you're obviously a terrific educator as well as an attorney, and I bet you're a fantastic supervisor. And the work that you do is really, really, really valuable. And I am very glad to have met you. And I'm glad to hear that because I think it's important that people understand what's happening. For a non-lawyer to come into this system and try to understand all the legalities, all the terminology and jargon that come up during any court proceeding, it can be really off-putting. And so for me, it's important. Yeah, it was daunting. It absolutely it's crazy. is. Yeah. <laughs> and I couldn't imagine trying to interpret all of this stuff, all these words, if I didn't have a legal background. So for me... It's important that I take the time to explain to people what's happening. For one reason in particular, it creates a sense of ownership and involvement. If I can understand the process, I can be a part of the process. And for me, that, that mutuality, our clients being involved in the case, am I giving back to them? And caregivers and collaterals and CASAs, everyone else is included in that. If they're involved in the case... The case, the quality of the case, the quality of my advocacy goes through the roof. And so the moments that we spend in those one-on-ones engaging with clients, CASAs, and caregivers is well worth it. And again, I think one last point I'll make on this is that you know, our clients very often have been given no agency in their lives as the victims of abuse and neglect. They often haven't had a say in how their lives unfold. If they understand what's happening and they know what's going to happen to them, they can express themselves. They can dictate more about what they need and want and help really regain that sense of ownership over their lives and an ability to direct their lives themselves. That's just wonderful to hear. And I think you're absolutely right. And thank you again for speaking with me today. And I know people will really enjoy listening to this. Thank you. Thank you. I'm really glad there's caring adults like Juan Valles taking care of kids in foster care. Without people like Juan getting involved, making a difference, sacrificing themselves, the fate of foster kids would be so much worse. The Children's Law Center is a not-for-profit. If you want to know more about them... Go to clccal.org. If you see something, say something. 
If you suspect that a child's health or safety is jeopardized in any way by parents or anyone else, contact the Child Protective Services Agency in your county. 24-hour hotlines are staffed by trained social workers who will help you through the process, and you can do so anonymously. In California, you can call the Child Protection Hotline at 800-540-4000. And right now in COVID, reports of abuse and neglect are down by 50%. And that's not because it's not happening. It's because kids are not in school and their teachers and other adults, mandated reporters, aren't seeing them. So if you see something, say something. You might be saving a child's life. And if you're an older kid in trouble, check out PennyLane.org. They offer a safe place for homeless and LGBTQ youth who need some help. And if you're a kid in care who wants a casa, you can ask for one. In Los Angeles, go to CasaLA.org. And anywhere else in the nation, go to NationalCasaGal.org. And you can get one. I want to thank the supremely talented Christina Apostolopoulos for her beautiful music, Eferisto. To hear more of her music, go to Spotify and Instagram at Christina Aposto. That's C-H-R-I-S-T-I-N-A-A-P-O-S-T-O. I I know you want to. Her stuff is really great. And thanks to my audio producer extraordinaire, Marcos Campito. I'm glad I found you. Thanks for listening. And if you like what you hear, please rate us and hit subscribe.